Good afternoon. I better go and remove my face mask again, um, otherwise people might not be able to see me. Welcome here in the Peatland Pavilion. Welcome all the people online that, I that are um, looking at this session from around the world. It's been a really pleasure to having you here today. Um, over the next hour and a half, we're going to have a, a series of esteemed speakers lined up to talk about peatlands in climate commitments, exchange of experience on NDCs and LTSs. And we are going to, it's going to be an amazing session. Well, Maria Nutinen of the FAO, who organized this session um, with a range of other people, asked me to talk about in particular in this opening is to say there is going to be an analysis of peatlands as part of the NDCs. We're working with that report and we're analyzing it as we speak. It is really good to hear from your experience on how peatlands are part of the NDCs and how they're included in that. And what we are going to do is follow up and look at all that information over the winter. And the report is due very early on next spring. So I put my glasses on because I'm afraid my eyesight is starting to fail after, after more than 50 years on, the, on this planet. Um, so it is really important to find the linkage between peatland data and the NDCs and climate action because only by understanding how much carbon there is in the peatlands and how they, the, the current emissions due to drainage are contributing to climate change and to the carbon emissions, we really need to bring that to the fore. But on the other hand, it's also really important to understand how the actions to reduce those emissions can be there, how they can be fi uh, financed and how they could be scaled up. So we are going to have a good hour and a half sessions with esteemed speakers and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and the questions, please put any questions into the, um, into the chat if you're online. I'm trying to have, if you're here in the audience, there is space for you to ask questions and you can do it live from here. I saw some people looking at me like, ah, what's happening? So that will be fine. So please join me over the next hour and a half and talk about peatlands and the people, peatlands in climate commitments, exchange of experience on NDCs and LTSs. The first speaker we're going to have up, and I'm going to be quite tight in people's times, I'm afraid, because we want a fully packed program, is Marshal Bernou. He's Senior Natural Resource Officer of the FAO, and he's going to talk to us about peatlands and these, on the climate commitments and peatlands. Why and how, and what does it mean for the country? Michelle, the floor is yours for seven minutes. Thank you so much. I guess you can hear me well, perfectly. So good. So without further ado, so it's a seven minute journey I have only, so I will be fast. So I am a, it's a great honor to be here to represent FAO and my colleague Maria Nutinem. That was really key in organizing uh, that presentation. And I will really focus on uh, enhancing peatland ambition in nationally, nationally determined contribution. So I will use uh, NDCs on the long-term strategies. I will use LTS along my, my talk. Next one, please. Okay, so the, the content you will see, the uh, introduction is really just to say here, you are in the pavilion of all the peatlands. So you can see the, uh, the, all the importance of peatland around the world on the benefits they can provide to people, to society in general. So I will not extend myself on the, the benefits on the, the role of Pitland, but mostly I will focus on the next uh, question you have on the two, three and four here. Why include Pitland in the NDCs? Or Pitland is featuring in the current NDCs on the new NDCs that are also put forward uh, regularly on what also FAO and other partners are doing to support countries. Next, please. So, perhaps just uh, trying to uh, answer that uh, first question, why to include peatland in the NDC? And you can see there is a lot of good reason to include peatland, either on the mitigation aspect, so reducing emission from peatland, either on the adaptation and resilience side to build more resilient uh, system, and also all, on all the other benefits, you can ecosystem benefits you can have also protecting biodiversity. So you, you can see a lot of different reasons country can use to as an entry to, to put this in their NDCs. Next one, please. 
on peatland, it's perhaps just to to, to start with a, a first difficulty that uh, we can see uh, when we will look at NDCs on peatland. Here, for instance, on the mitigation uh, side, peatland can hide in different land use categories. Because you have peatland in cropland, you have peatland in other land use. So basically, in terms of uh, the way countries will see or will put this in their NDC can be influenced by the categories of peatland they have in their country. So it's not uh, an homogeneous approach that uh, we have. And you can have also countries that will focus on the peat extraction, for instance. So it will be in cross-cutting different land use category of uh, IPCC, let's say, uh, like that. Next one, please. On adaptation, this is the same. When we will look on the different uh, policy document, NDC document, LTS uh, document, basically, uh, in terms of uh, adaptation, peatland can fall under, again, different categories in terms of adaptive capacity for, of communities, in terms of restoration, or eventually it can be, you can see, for instance, in a reweighting activity, so it can fall in the, that activities, and also sometimes just reducing fire risk. So here you have a, a list, a long list, I will not read that, but it is exactly the same for adaptation angle. Next one, please. Wow. Uh, so it's a glitch, but it's fine. What I want to say here that hopefully we have some kind of methodologies. So we have three main kind of major methodologies that can help us to look where peatland are. On next one, please. So first, all, uh, those methodology you might know it's from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So you have the first one, uh, uh, IPCC 2006. So it's really 15 years old. But here, you have specifically something on managed peatland. So it can be an entry point where a country can, can use. Uh, the, the drawback here, it's only concerning CO2. Next one, please. Then IPCC reflected on to how to improve, basically, the methodology. And here, you have a, a dedicated supplement only on wetlands. So in wetlands, you, you can find peatlands, you can find mangroves, you can find organic soil, so different way to, to name those pitlands. And here you, you can have also uh, taken into consideration all the CO2, methane, N2O, nitrous oxide, and also dissolved organic uh, carbon you can have from, uh, from, uh, from pitland. Next one, please. Here, this is the last refinement that was adopted uh, last uh, end, end of 2019. So it's a refinement of the first 2006 a guideline, and you can see that what basically the key message to have uh, from that uh, guideline, last one, is basically the 2013 supplement remains a reference for pitland. There is no much add addition on uh, pitland in that uh, specific guidelines. Perhaps they just added uh, methane on top of, of CO2, but really the entry point for pitland as a 2013 uh, spe special menu. Next one, I uh, need to run. So, next one. Okay, so let's do two, two graphics here and, uh, that show you that you have the previous NDC, who's the first uh, indent, intended nationally uh, determined contribution, and here up to 85 new NDC. Countries are also coming with new NDCs. And you can see that it depends on where countries are referring to, let's say, Pitlang as whole, so it can be mangrove, organic soil, peatland, wetland, they can use different uh, wording. And you can see here the good news, it's an increasing. So the red bars are higher than the blue bar. Next one. On, when you look per region, you can see also it's basically increasing. For Asia Pacific, this is an artifact due to the number of new NDC already available. So uh, as, uh, as far, uh, when we will have new NDC put forward, basically this bar will, uh, will, uh, will increase. And I will, can you jump perhaps just to the last slide? You will have all the presentation you can, you can read. So just not to mention, okay, that one. Uh, we are supporting countries in the different ways with partners. And here you can see what we can do. We can help countries to mobilize finance to have projects dedicated to pitland to work on the enhanced transparency aspect for reporting, 
for instance, or in terms of action, in terms of mitigation, adaptation, and also in terms of glo global advocacy. And just when on that point, Cornivia, I was a little bit running uh, late uh, arriving to that side event because Cornivia is going on. And sh here it's a discussion ongoing on agriculture in general, but it can be also an entry point to advocate for the value of peatland on when it concerns cropland. And I will end here. Sorry, I've been uh, quite uh, fast, but you will have all the presentation, so uh, it will be shared with all of you online. So basically, if you have uh, also any question, do not hesitate to refer to me. So ending here. Thank you, Martial. Um, oof, I'm struggling with things around my head and things moving forward. Thank you for keeping so well to time, and I'm afraid we need to start moving on to the next speaker now. Um, any questions for, is that one yours, Martial? Probably. The, any questions for Martial will pick up later on in the session and you can ask online as well. Next up, we've got the, um, the Minister of the Environment and Sustainable Development of the Congo Basin, as far as I'm aware. Yes, and um, Madame, um, Madame Minister Sudan Nonold. No? Sorry? Okay, sorry, there's been a slight change in, 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 um, in process because um, the minister is running a little bit late, but we've got now a video of um, the Minister of the Environment of Peru, His Excellency Ruben José Ramínez Mateo of Peru. Guys, take it away. Buenas tardes, ministros, representantes de gobiernos de Indonesia, República Democrática del Congo, de Chile, Alemania, representantes de la FAO, y sin foro, estimados organizadores, distinguidos delegados y participantes. Es grato poder acompañarlos en esta sesión que se desarrolla en el pabellón de turberas de la COP26, que tiene por finalidad mostrar los desafíos y avances de nuestros compromisos climáticos relacionados con las turberas. El Perú, a través del Ministerio del Ambiente, ha realizado en este año esfuerzos para destacar la importancia de la conservación de las turberas a través de la aprobación de instrumentos y de una política nacional para la gestión multisectorial y descentralizada de los humedales. Con el apoyo del Proyecto Iniciativa Mundial de Turberas hemos desarrollado talleres nacionales de amplia convocatoria para gestores y expertos que permitieron el intercambio sobre conocimiento y el estado de las turberas en los tres principales biomas del país. Amazonía Andes y Costa, evidenciándose la necesidad de contar con la información actualizada y confiable sobre la dimensión del Estado, presiones y amenazas de las turberas y promover acciones para su gestión sostenible. Producto de estas acciones, venimos formulando una nueva medida que formará parte de la contribución nacional determinada, NDC, buscando valor al rol de las turberas como medida de mitigación considerando que las turberas ubicadas en la selva baja de la amazonía peruana tienen la capacidad de almacenar altas concentraciones de carbono en el suelo esta propuesta denominada conservación y gestión sostenible de turberas amazónicas consiste en la identificación de diferentes modalidades de conservación y la gestión sostenible de los recursos naturales derivados de ellas, de la mano con el fortalecimiento de las capacidades de los pueblos indígenas y comunidades locales para asegurar su gestión participativa y sostenible. Asimismo, hemos identificado grandes desafíos, como la necesidad de contar con un marco metodológico para la identificación de las turberas a lo largo del territorio nacional. La estimación del potencial de mitigación de las turberas requiere nutrirse con información clave como base para su monitoreo. Estamos seguros que sin un marco legal adecuado, los esfuerzos también pueden dilatarse. Por ello, en el Perú contamos con la Ley Marco sobre el Cambio Climático, como norma que guía la gestión integral frente al cambio climático, con enfoque multisectorial, multinivel y multiactor. Asimismo, Venimos actualizando nuestro instrumento de política priorizados como la Estrategia Nacional de la Diversidad Biológica y la Estrategia Nacional Frente al Cambio Climático al año 2050, 
con miras a alcanzar la meta de la carbono neutralidad. Esperamos que el camino que estamos trazando, así como el desarrollo de sinergias con agentes de cooperación y el intercambio de experiencias con otras iniciativas similares, nos permitan hacer frente a los desafíos y concretar nuestra medida de mitigación en las turberas amazónicas. Muchas gracias a todos los actores que han contribuido con este esfuerzo. Minister of Peru, um, the Excellency Robin Jose Ramirez Mateo. It's great to hear on how Peru has taken um, NDCs and as part of it, of, of peatlands as part of their NDCs. Um, we're still, ah, we're, sorry, I just get been given a, a pointer here. So I think at the moment we've got the, the Minister of the Environment, Madame Arlette Susano. Do we have got, got her here yet? No. Um, I think we're going. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, it is a bit. Uh, <clears throat> it's it's trying to find the right people coming to the session, and so what we're now is slightly changing plan, and we're going to move now to um, Mr. Um, Dr. Bambuta, Jean-Jacques Bambuta, from the Peatland Focal Point of the. Um, the Democratic Republic of Congo Ministry of the Environment and Sustainable Development and talking about what kind of enhancements they you are know, talking about peatlands and peatlands in the um, DRC Congo. The floor is yours for eight minutes I'm afraid. Thank you. Mesdames et Messieurs, à vos titres, bonjour, je suis Jean-Jacques Bambuta, je travaille pour le ministère de l'Environnement et du Développement Durable en République démocratique du Congo. Je suis donc le coordonnateur de l'unité de gestion des tourbières et aussi je suis sur le point focal de tourbières en République démocratique du Congo. Alors, je voudrais vous entretenir sur quatre petits points assez rapidement, en commençant par une sorte d'état de lieu de la gestion des tourbières en République démocratique du Congo. Et je parlerai de la question de la prise en, en compte des tourbières dans la contribution nationale déterminée. Je donnerai quelques leçons encourageantes et je finirai par quelques étapes à venir. Alors, donc, nous, en République démocratique du Congo, nous voulons articuler la gestion des tourbières autour des de, de, de problématiques suivantes. D'abord, nous voulons commencer par nous demander où sont les tourbières de la République démocratique du Congo. Là, il s'agit de la cartographie. Et que représente cette tourbière Là, nous entrons en termes de l'évaluation du stock de carbone et euh, euh, quels seraient les itinéraires en termes de, 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 de production des moyens de subsistance. Parce que, comme vous savez, dans certaines zones, les milieux de tourbières sont des zones de production des moyens de subsistance pour les communautés. Et donc, telles sont nos trois problématiques euh, qui nous concernent en ce moment. Alors, nous avons défini une vision nationale de tourbières. Et cette vision euh, est en fait une jonction d'ensemble d'efforts qui devront être conjugués par un certain nombre de, à la fois de, de thématiques et aussi euh, un certain nombre d'interventions. Et cette vision, nous allons y revenir là-dessus. Après que nous ayons obtenu cette vision, nous voulons aller vers le développement d'une stratégie nationale de tourbières. Puisqu'il s'agit d'une thématique émergente qui a des connexions avec les autres thématiques, il va falloir donc identifier une politique nationale qui sera dédiée à cet écosystème. Donc nous avons une vision et on a une stratégie à définir. Et euh, cette stratégie, elle devra être définie sur base de deux piliers. Le premier pilier, ce sont les consultations des parties prenantes nationales et internationales. Le deuxième pilier, ça serait les, les, la collecte des données sur les études multisectorielles. Et tout cela tient dans une sorte de feuille de route qui a été définie par le pays depuis déjà un an. Alors maintenant, euh, où en sommes-nous Comme vous le savez, la, la République démocratique du Congo est membre de l'initiative mondiale sur les tourbières 
Donc, c'est depuis 2016 que nous avons des contacts avec le GPI. Et euh, en 2017, nous avons reçu les premières estimations de cartographie de tourbières, mais aussi de leur évaluation de, 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 de stock de carbone, qui nous a été faite par euh, nos collègues de l'Université Leeds. Et là-dedans, là cela nous a permis de pouvoir attirer notre attention sur cet écosystème. Et en 2018, la République démocratique du Congo a signé ce qu'on appelle la déclaration de Brazzaville, aux côtés de l'Indonésie euh, et de la République du Congo, une déclaration qui est essentiellement basée sur la gestion durable et la conservation des tourbières. En 2019, nous avons commencé euh, le projet Initiative mondiale sur les tourbières, qui est essentiellement calé sur le renforcement des capacités, mais aussi le développement des connaissances autour de cet écosystème. Parce que, comme vous le savez, nous sommes là en train de parler d'une thématique émergente pour laquelle on a besoin euh, d'informations. Et euh, en 2020, euh, nous avons commencé les travaux préliminaires de l'identification de notre stratégie. Là, nous sommes en plein euh, euh, dans le volet de renforcement des capacités avec un certain nombre d'activités en termes de, de l'évaluation des capacités nationales, l'identification des cadres et des de politiques qui peuvent avoir des synergies et des jonctions avec la stratégie nationale des tourbières. Nous pensons qu'en 2022, on pourra commencer avec le, le, le projet le plus important déjà sur le terrain, qui seront peut-être aussi euh, 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 appuyés par l'initiative mondiale sur les tourbières, mais surtout, il s'agira de développer des projets dans le paysage du bassin du Congo, en tenant compte à la fois de cet écosystème que nous avons et que nous partageons en commun entre la République du Congo et la République démocratique du Congo. Next. Alors, notre vision, je venais de le dire, la, la, la RDC est consciente de l'importance des tourbières dans l'atténuation du climat mondial. Et pour ce faire, la République démocratique du Congo a identifié une vision qui veut qu'il va falloir protéger les tourbières pour le peuple et la nature. Et les efforts de conservation des tourbières devront en réalité servir à améliorer le vécu des communautés locales et des peuples autochtones. Donc s'il y a des retombées qui viennent de la conservation, elles devront servir à améliorer les vies des communautés pour que ces communautés ne puissent pas attaquer cet écosystème. C'est ça en fait notre vision que nous sommes en train d'articuler. Euh, maintenant, en ce qui concerne la prise en compte des tourbières dans le processus de CEDEN, nous avons à ce stade appris un certain nombre de leçons. Une des premières leçons se trouve être les cartes et une définition convenue et consensuelle de tourbières. Parce que comme nous le savons, actuellement nous avons beaucoup plus d'informations qui nous disent que les tourbières de la République démocratique du Congo ne sont pas que dans le bassin central. Il se pourrait que nous ayons des tourbières dans la partie euh, où nous avons le mangrove. Dans, et, et il pourrait aussi que nous ayons des tourbières dans les plateaux de, de, du Katanga et d'autres dans la vallée du Rift. Donc il va falloir dans cet ensemble découvrir et identifier une définition qui tienne compte de cette diversité de cet écosystème. Et euh, nous pensons qu'il va falloir pour cela identifier et, et lancer des consultations avec de, des parties prenantes. Mais dans ce contexte de Covid, comme vous le savez, nos efforts en termes de déploiement ont été amoindris parce qu'il va falloir un peu, un peu prêter attention à l'aspect euh, santé. Mais nous pensons que le développement des capacités est, euh, est aussi un axe très important dans la gestion des tourbières. Il va falloir qu'on se demande si nous voulons gérer les tourbières, on devra le faire avec quelle capacité. Et un des, des derniers éléments, c'est ce que nous pouvons appeler des intérêts conflictuels entre les différents secteurs. Nous parlons des tourbières, mais les tourbières sont aussi en lien avec le processus RAID+, en lien avec l'aménagement du territoire, en lien avec le foncier. Et tout cela, il va falloir les articuler autour d'un corpus national qui tienne compte de toutes ces interventions et de toutes ces thématiques. Et nos prochaines étapes, c'est essentiellement lancer les consultations avec les parties prenantes nationales, identifier une définition nationale de tourbières, poursuivre la collecte des données multisectorielles en termes d'abord de cartographie et d'évaluation de stock de carbone, et peut-être voir comment on peut procéder par exemple à l'implantation des tours à flux dans les zones à tourbières afin que nous puissions obtenir des données en temps réel.
Et d'autres étapes très importantes seront aussi soulignées dans les sessions que nous allons avoir dans euh, ce pavillon autour de, au cours des jours qui vont euh, suivre. Alors, peut-être qu'il y a quelques questions clés qu'il va falloir qu'on puisse, sur lesquelles il va falloir qu'on réfléchisse. Une des premières questions se trouve être comment sécuriser les ressources pour cartographier et améliorer les moyens de subsistance. Parce que, comme vous le savez, euh, il est important de pouvoir faire en sorte que la production de moyens de subsistance ne puisse pas provoquer le drainage qui va à son tour assécher les zones à tourbières. Donc tout cela nécessite une importante réflexion. Et nous avons une deuxième question, c'est comment prioriser euh, les tourbières Si par exemple nous nous rendons compte qu'en République démocratique du Congo, nous avons plusieurs formes de tourbières, alors comment on va faire en ce que tout cela puisse contribuer, n'est-ce pas, à l'ensemble de l'effort national qui est la gestion de l'ensemble de l'écosystème des tourbières. Et pour finir, notre dernière question, c'est qu'avons-nous appris sur les classes d'occupation de, des terres Comme je le disais, en fait, il va falloir faire attention aux connexions de différentes thématiques, dont l'aménagement du territoire, le foncier, le processus RED, que tout cela puisse contribuer à l'ensemble des efforts que le pays devra fournir pour que la contribution de tourbières puisse améliorer la contribution nationale déterminée. Voilà un peu, euh, je pense, les quelques éléments que nous avions à partager. C'est par ici que je vais m'arrêter. Merci. Ok, sorry. Thank you very much. Sorry, oh, it's great. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and it's great to hear from you. Um, <coughs> Is my mic live, guys? Good, thank you very much. Um, things are a bit hectic here today, so we've, um, we're trying to do it as good as we can with ministers, and ministers are always busy at COPs like this, so it's sometimes difficult to bring them in at last minute and things and timetables shift. So what we're doing is we're going to, instead of going having questions now, we go first to, and I've got to put my glasses up again, um, Dr. Chris Dickinson, of the Green Climate Fund, the Ecosystem Management Senior Specialist. And after that, we come back to questions and then hopefully by then the ministers will be here and we can hear the presentations from the ministers. So if, you're, if, if that's okay with you, and I'm looking at my esteemed speaker just that we just finished, we're first going to have a presentation by Mr. Dickinson and then we hear questions on the, both the presentations. Chris Dickinson, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Oh. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Dickinson. I work for the Green Climate Fund. It's a pleasure here uh, to be here today to talk to you about uh, what we do as the world's largest climate finance organization and also possibly how we work with peatlands and other ecosystems. Um, so first of all, I first encountered peatlands a long time ago in Scotland when I was studying uh, ecology at the University of Aberdeen. I didn't realize in those days that peatlands occurred all over the world from um, uh, to Mong Mongolia to the Andes Mountains to tropical forests. So it's an amazing ecosystem um, with many common features but very unique challenges in how they can be managed and uh, conserved and protected. They also contribute a lot towards the country's national determinative contributions and to global greenhouse gas um, and mitigation, but also for adaptation. They have a very big role in uh, biodiversity, livelihoods, and provision of ecosystem services, especially water. So I'd like to discuss um, a bit about the GCF and how we work in to help support countries with um, aspects like uh, pig peatland conservation. So first of all, we were formed in 2010 by the UNFCCC. Uh, we serve the Paris Agreement for developing countries and have a mandate to allocate our funding to, to governments and countries to help them support um, both climate mitigation and adaptation. Especially in terms of our geographical priority is with the least, development, least developed countries, Africa and small island states. We're country driven, which means that our guidance for projects comes from the countries and from the NDCs. And we're also a partnership organization. So we have a lot of partnerships with uh, different entities. There's 180 accredited entities now, and we're trying to increase them all the time. 
And we also have a lot of flexibility in our investments. So our investments can cover loans, grants, equity, reimbursable grants, and many different financial mechanisms which could be used for, for peatland um, management or conservation. Um, the first thing that we can help with is supporting readiness. So we've supported 140 countries, help build their capacity for, um, for climate change, for access to finance. We currently have a readiness project from DRC to help support uh, peatland management and develop the country's um, plans and policies. Hopefully this will be approved uh, in 2022, uh, but that's gonna have a very big impact in preparing the ground for future projects to invest in DRC's incredible uh, uh, peatlands. We also fund projects through ex accredited entities. At the moment, there aren't that many looking at peatlands, but uh, what's known as FP01, the first ever Green Climate Fund project was actually a peatland project in Peru called Building Resilience in Wetlands in, in Peru with a, a direct access entity called Pronapi. This is looking at land use, um, it's looking at uh, non-timber forest products and economic incentives for managing uh, peatland swamps and peatland forests. And the challenge for that one is to scale up across the country. It was only a small project. It will need to scale up across uh, larger areas of Peru. We also have a Red Plus window, the last in 2020. And uh, Indonesia received $100 million for results-based payments from Mission Reduction, which was from um, forests, swamp forests, and also the, uh, uh, the peatland areas. That's going to be used for social forestry and for helping improve the um, future investments in Red Plus in the country. So although there are those only two approved projects, there are some in the pipeline. For example, we have the DRC Readiness. There's uh, projects in Indonesia and the Andes looking at peatlands in the future. But uh, given the overall global significance of peatlands, it's quite surprising we don't have uh, many projects. So why? Uh, why is that? Perhaps the audience also have some ideas, or maybe it's also an opportunity for accredited entities to work together to develop projects. So for example, the type of project that could be developed in peatlands could be very similar to ones approved for forestry. In the last board meeting, there was a project uh, supporting um, six, five countries in the Amazon basin, funded by the IDB bank. This is aimed to try to fund community enterprises and uh, smallholders uh, in terms of value chains related to forestry conservation, such as non-timber forest products, uh, cocoa under the canopy, and other, um, other uh, activities related to um, sustainable land management. This type of facility could be something that could be done in peatlands. We also have projects with uh, public banks. And one of the problems that I think that uh, smallholders and farmers have is the lack of access to capital, uh, especially small microfinance or small amounts of uh, finance uh, for investing in the very small areas. So how do we solve that? Uh, we have projects working with local banks where we have the accredited entity has technical assistance facility, and then the bank is provided money which they can offer at lower interest rates to farmers. This sort of investment system could be very useful for Indonesia, perhaps, where there are uh, cultivation systems which are complementary with uh, peatland restoration and also peatland management. And also, perhaps, there are value chains in the peatlands which can be um, also supported, such as in terrestrial forests, we have projects in Africa looking at shea butter, gums, or argan oils. What products are there in the peatlands around the world which also can be, um, can be managed by local people? Uh, we also see that there are projects that are being looked at to expand conservation of peatlands. So, for example, also in DRC, there will be a readiness project, uh, hopefully endorsed this week, which is looking at expanding, identifying the hotspot uh, peatlands areas and trying to designate these as effective protected areas involving local people. So there's lots of potential ideas for finance. I think we just need to bring together some of the relevant accredited entities to come up with some innovative solutions and ideas for managing 
uh, uh, peatlands around the world. Okay, so that's just my very quick presentation and I hand over to the facilitator and the next step. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you, Chris. It's great to hear from you. And it's, as we always know, finance is absolutely crucial to get these pro projects off the ground. It's not only including peatlands in NDCs and making sure that they are properly included, but then we need to act on them. And if there's anything clear for me at this COP, and also from outside, I've only got to talk, uh, think about young, young Swedish people, such as, um, so as there was Greta, action is critical. For action, we need, we need funds. And it's really good to hear from Chris on how we can unlock these funds, not only through the, 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 um, the GEF, but also through private finance. And on Thursday, we'll be running another session about finance and private finance and how private finance could, could help and support and solve some of the, um, and, the, and find, uh, fund some of these projects. So the finance is building and it's a, it's a really interesting area to talk about. But before we dive into that or any further, and I'm just looking now as well, I just wondered if there's any questions from either from, from the floor or let's first talk actually to questions from online. <clears throat> and I've got, um, when I hear here, um, we've been hearing questions from online, I think, what, is, what do you think the main barriers are to upscaling restoration to the level it needs to be? Um, the question came up with quite a high like, so I'm going to, to fire that first to, um, probably to Chris first, and then I'll ask um, Dr. Bambuta. Chris, what do you think are the main barriers to upscaling? Um, okay, that's a good question. Okay, take this off. Uh, there are lots of technical barriers, but I think one, um, probably the biggest barriers for upscaling are um, social issues and political issues. The conflict between land and agriculture is obviously a big issue. And also developing models which can be economic and can be upscaled is also something that uh, needs to be looked at. So perhaps the... Sorry? Okay. Maybe some feedback. So I think the providing access to finance is something that's really crucial once the models have been tested. Uh, perhaps through small projects or through existing projects, is to try and then provide farmers access to finance, such as the examples that I mentioned, through national banks, through public banks, and also through, through a private sector. Um, I think one of the problems with finance is that often it's easy for farmers to get access to very tiny amounts of money, and it's also possible for large companies to access 10, 20, 30 million dollars. But the bits in between, the, the missing middle, I think that's the hardest part. There are very few impact investors which, in, which are looking at small investments because they're looking for um, big investments. So the transaction costs are much lower. So that's one of the barriers. And also there's a competing agriculture, which can be sometimes more profitable. And also land ownership. One of the problems in many countries is land tenure is not really secure. If farmers have concrete ownership of land, there's more incentive to invest in that. If it's uncertain, then it sometimes results in unsustainable uh, management and uh, unsustainable, no incentive for restoring the ecosystem or managing it in a better, more productive, uh, regenerative way. Okay, um, thank you. Um, this is one of the more chaotic sessions that I've, that I've heard, um, but it's going absolutely fine. And we, I'm very, very proud to be able to pronounce that the Vice Minister of the, um, and I've just got to look here, the Vice Minister of the Environment and Forestry, um, Vice Minister Duhong, Alu Duhong from Indonesia, is ready to speak and one wanted to talk about peat and peatlands in the NDC. Vice Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm Haruni Kishnawati and uh, representing my uh, Vice Minister of Environment and Forestry. So I'm here uh, on his behalf because right now 
uh, he is uh, with my minister. So uh, please allow me to uh, present about peatland information supporting climate commitments in Indonesia. A bit overview about the presentation. The first, next please, we would like to share about Indonesian experience of NDC and long-term strategy process. And uh, we will talk share about peatland information uh, supporting climate actions and what it's, uh, we need for peatland monitoring and what the status updates and some key messages. Next, please. Our NDC uh, experience, we know that uh, peatland has been covered in our NDC and Indonesia has covered climate actions across all sectors. And we also have submitted our updated NDC uh, with enhancements which include additional uh, supporting targets. And uh, on the updated NDC, enhanced emissions include adaptation is one of the key focus area. And peatlands and forests uh, is key factors. And we call this as uh, follow next in 2030. Next, please. Our experience on long-term strategies, as we say in July 2021, uh, Indonesia has submitted the long-term strategy on low carbon and climate resilience uh, 2050. And the Indonesian long-term strategy uh, is amb amb ambitious. And peatlands and forests as key factors for climate action. Following the COVID-19 recovery, of course, further attentions need to be done and uh, indicative pathway will be lead from the NDC goals to the long-term impacts. What's the peatland information? Next page. What the peatland information uh, can support the climate action? Here we can share about peatland information. The first, harmonize peatlands maps, which is very important. We can know where uh, to guide land use to take place, and about restoration planning, and also about fire risk prevention. Next information is about monitoring approaches for peatlands restorations, especially for uh, which are developing rapidly. And next, about socioeconomics, including gender aspect of midland restoration. And of course, uh, what's the current key task is to train our capacity from the site level, from the project level, and then through province, and of course, to the uh, national and landscape level. What is major highlights for peatland situation? Our ministry has set up the situation rooms to monitor peatlands. We have here our director for peatland degradation control, who actually, Ibu Ati, who also in charge in uh, setting up this. So the uh, peatland situation will be placed in her directorate. So later on, we can have further discussion with her. And we take advantages from various peatland monitoring approaches, which is, has been developed by a partnership with many national and international actors. For example, uh, from field level groundwater level monitoring, which is uh, automatized measurement station, which has been developed by FIO, it also could be a potential uh, to support the uh, development in terms of the peatland monitoring in our country. The other major highlights for greenhouse gas uh, emission estimates, the tools or the instrument that has been developed by uh, partners can be used to uh, support to easily uh, estimate greenhouse gas emissions from different management options. 
and then we can uh, adapt it or tailor to Indonesian condition following the international IPCC guidelines. The other advantages of peatland greenhouse gas uh, tools. Next, please. Uh, next, please. We can provide the quantitative uh, projection of the impacts of peatland management. Uh, next, please. It can also provide data and information for the better informed decision making and help uh, comparing different management scenario. And of course, uh, it will have improved land management and planning. The other major highlights that we can uh, see from the development of satellites, uh, tools or technology, for example, for satellite soil moisture, we know that uh, FIO already uh, in the development of this tool, it could be uh, very, very uh, beneficial or very useful for, to help the countries in monitoring uh, so soil measure for peatland and also to allocate the, the peatland uh, uh, explicitly, uh, spatially explicit. So there will be a good correlation what is groundwater level, what is key variable for greenhouse gas emissions, and it also can be used online. What is the status update? Next, please. For the peatland monitoring. As we know, the Indonesia, uh, we have ambitious peatland uh, restoration targets and land use sector has been put as a key contributor for reducing greenhouse gas emission and also put in the, our long, uh, long term strategy and Indonesia has uh, declared or announced about Netsing Volu, Volu Netsing to 2030, which is peatland, is part of the land sector that will be a key uh, contributor to greenhouse gas emission reduction. So monitoring has to be the place since the start to, de uh, to demonstrate the satellite, the benefits and adapt uh, restoration effort. And uh, various approach are developing of fast for cost-effective large-scale monitoring. Next, please. By demonstrating climate benefits, uh, Indonesia has more uh, opportunity to access the climate finance. So our vision, uh, we hope that Indonesia could be a leader in peatland uh, monitoring efforts. What's next, please? What's the opportunity to explore for the future in terms of peatland monitoring in Indonesia? At first, advancing with the landscape level, uh, full rewetting with all stakeholders group. And then increase uh, subsidence and groundwater level research and data will help in terms of uh, refining the use monitoring tools and improving greenhouse gas emissions estimates accuracy. And of course, uh, improved socioeconomic data will help targeting the actions for green recovery. And New data on fire in peatlands is also very uh, important. Uh, will allow for further tools developments and also enhancement of national climate commitments. I think the last uh, slide, what the key message is, uh, valid peatland maps, of course, uh, is necessary to improve the land use and achieving the results. And Indonesia peatland monitoring efforts are encouraging example for climate action on peatland, which allow the improvement of adaptive peatland restoration and helping to steer action to reduce risk of fire. The key element is a robust, accessible monitoring system design and linkage to uh, preventive action capacity development. And next step for climate commitments is enhancing ambitions, ambition to allow 
accession climate finance. And uh, of course, building the strong linkage from the medium term commitments uh, in NDC to the long term uh, commitments, long term strategy. I think uh, uh, that's all the messages that we could deliver in this session. And apology for uh, very fast feeding because uh, right now uh, we need to <laughs> have another another session. So uh, again, apology from our vice minister who cannot make it uh, here because. Uh, at the same time, we also have another important agenda in our pavilion. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, and thank you for stepping in last minute in, <clears throat> in talking about the important work that Indonesia is doing on peatlands. Um, we, as Wetlands International, have been working with Indonesia for many a year in mapping and restoring the peatlands and a great deal of, of, of progress has been made in that. So we're really proud to hear on how Indonesia is doing and Indonesia has been leading from very early on the, the understanding of peatlands but has also been very um, exposed to all the, <clears throat> the downsides of drained peatlands. With the drained peatlands and the fires um, there have been massive um, impacts there on the economy and the fires have also had a great impact on the health of the people. And we've seen that replicated around the world, not only in, in Indonesia and, the, um, and Asia, but also in Africa, but also in, in, in Latin America, whereby the fires in the Pantanal last year created massive problems. And these were drained peatlands that caught fire, not only creating economic damage and not only emitting huge amounts of, of carbon um, into the atmosphere, but also creating impact on, on human health. And that was one of the reasons, and in a previous session, um, one of my colleagues, Tatiana Minayeva, was talking about a big uh, research, uh, a big uh, restoration project in, thank you, um, uh, the pointer? No? Uh, a big restoration project, my apologies, a big restoration project in Russia, whereby in 2010, we know that 50,000 excess deaths occurred because of peatlands causing fire. And as a result of the work that we've done now, the fire incurrence is going down, the carbon is being stored, and the, um, the livelihoods of people on the ground is improving. Because as Wetlands International, we always work on that interface between people, climate, and nature. So it's great to see all these things. So thank you all our esteemed speak speakers so far. What I've just heard is that um, the Minister of um, the, the, the minister that we've had lined up from the, the, the Congo, the Republic of the Congo, is not going to attend anymore. So I'm going now into questions and answers, which I think uh, there's quite a few lined up here, and I'd like to hear that and hear from our esteemed panel. So I am not, so I'm, I'm going, what I'll go and do is I'll first take a, a question from the online to the panel, and then I'll go and go back to a question in the room and we keep alternating until we, so we get a really good discussion going. So I've got a question uh, online here. So what is, um, and I'm looking and I've got, it's quite nice actually. It's great to have a moderator online that can tell me um, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the importance of the questions. And th the first question is, how can we account for emissions from wildfires? in drained or degraded peatlands. Who from my esteemed panel would like to, uh, to answer that question? Would you like to answer? Uh, it would be good to have a microphone en here. Ce concerne, okay, okay, ah oui. En ce qui concerne les émissions de feu, je voudrais souligner que si vous regardez L'expérience de l'Indonésie, nous, République démocratique du Congo, mm -hmm. nous avons une, une expérience différente. Les tourbières sont intactes parce qu'elles sont inondées et d'accès difficile, ce qui est différent de l'Indonésie. Et donc, à ce stade, en ce qui concerne les tourbières de la République démocratique du Congo, nous ne parlons pas de cette, cette attaque par le, le, le feu. Par contre, Il est important que nous puissions mener des actions qui vont faire en sorte que ces tourbières ne soient pas attaquées par le feu dans les années euh, ou les siècles qui viennent. 
c'est là l'importance de pouvoir mener des études de cartographie pour les, bien le localiser, que l'on sache que dans la zone A, il y a des tourbières, dans la zone Z, il y a des tourbières. Et de là, commencer à faire des plans d'aménagement ou de gestion de terre pour que les communautés puissent avoir leurs endroits où ils produisent leurs moyens de subsistance sans pouvoir attaquer les tourbières. Donc, tout cela doit être défini dans une politique nationale, dans une stratégie nationale. Voilà ce que je peux dire à ce stade. Merci. Thank you very much indeed. Um, is there another response here from one of my esteemed panel? Yeah, but well, just to add on... Uh, if you want to take your mask off, it's easier for people to hear you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I will start a, a bit, I guess it's easier. So you can hear me well. Yes. So no, just to add uh, more general in wildfire and fire, uh, hopefully now we have uh, instruments. So we have uh, remote sensing capacity with dedicated uh, sensors that are able to monitor on uh, FAO, but also with uh, other partners. We are collecting those information. So you might uh, be aware of uh, MODIS, for instance, satellite. And uh, recently, the, we modified a little bit the way we are uh, improving uh, the, the capture of uh, all those fires because you need to, to avoid the redundancy, for instance. Oh, we have nice music on the side. I am. Uh, so, sorry. but. Situation yeah. next door, we've got some live music on. So, but, uh, I hope you can see the. So, basically, we have information, but we need to, to combine satellite data with on the ground information because basically, satellites are still not really precise as we would need. And basically, no, 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 we need to have uh, that combination working with the country, having team on the ground and cap building capacity for having uh, that combination of satellite imagery and data on the ground. So this is what I want uh, to say. And we have a repository of FAO stat where you can find also, we transform that information we have from surface in terms of hectare of wildfire in terms of greenhouse gas emission, for yes, instance. So this is uh, the kind of information we have. Thank you, esteemed panelists. Um, on our own experience, it's quite clear that the emissions from peat fires are, and, from, and from wildfires are not only going straight to the atmosphere in terms of the various gaseous emissions, but also the, the particulate matter leaving at the end of the fires is also going down through the aqueous phase. So there is one component going up the atmosphere and one component is going either with the wind as dust or with the water going through the rivers as well. So I think it's, it's very important that we consider all aspects, and I'm sure that the satellite imagery will help us to look at areas in total, but also look at the aqueous and about the gaseous emissions and the particulate emissions. Mathial. Uh, uh, on that, you are right, it's not just greenhouse gas emission, it's also air pollution on a particulate uh, matter 2.5, PM 2.5, as we are saying, methane emission. On just on all that, we have the, the climate and clean air coalition, for instance, that is trying to combine approaches and support country. It's on the, the left, and it's trying to combine uh, climate and pollution and air pollution. Perhaps uh, uh, an important milestone that IPCC uh, mm -hmm. decided this year to, to scope uh, a new report, to develop a new methodology to look on how to combine the methodology to report on greenhouse gas with air pollution, for instance, on PM 2.5, on methane, on other short lived climate pollutants. So in the next, I would say, two years, we will have methodology that we will be able to report on what you are also mentioning, all those pollutants that are really important for health aspects of the population that are living close by. Uh, Absolutely. The and thinking about the the climate of the green of the carbon emissions in terms of dissolved and particulate organic matter within the water courses itself. We can add and build on top of that. So thank you very much indeed. I've got one question here now I thought from the floor earlier from our live people. Can you please tell me who you are and, and the question and then we'll see how our esteemed panel can answer it. Okay, my name is Hans Handel Jamba. I'm from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm the NDA for GCF and DRC. So you talk about the readiness we submitted recently. Uh, I can say that it was a long way to start. Uh, we did almost two years with uh, UNEP, we did a workout. So we tried to decide to do ourselves, that's what we did. So we did it and now, uh, like uh, 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 my, my colleague uh, told you, it's already in the GCF in the process of, of uh, approbation. 
So uh, beside this, we have another one coming up. It will be a kind of, we don't know, as, uh, we, don't, didn't, we didn't just uh, provide the amount, but we are, we are developing a, a full-size project of uh, pit, pit land in DRC. So it will be just follow through him, uh, our, you know, the, the one who's in charge of uh, pit land. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm backing up, uh, you know, I'm backing him up because uh, my, my role is just to provide the country with more, more project. So even when we don't have a accredited entity, but most, some of them, they are now focusing on DRC on this uh, matter. That's why I can, I want to say, so that's why I don't want to just take the, 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 the micro forever. So thank you very much. Yeah. That the, as we said earlier, that the NDCs, it's not only about ambitions, it's not only about setting this is the emission reduction that we go for, but also how are we going to do that? And it's great to see countries now leading from, from the front and picking up these projects and really getting on with it and, and implementing it. And I think as a community, as a peatland community here in the peatland pavilion, through the Global Peatland Initiative, we need to celebrate this. We need to show this to the world. And I would like to, to reach out to you and see how we can show this better and how we can show this more, not only during events where we are now, we're in the midst of the negotiations, ministers running everywhere, and I'm just starting to pull my hair out, who is next going to be the speaker, but also in a more, re more um, relaxed setting, whereby we can even use either the Global Peatland Initiative or something akin to create real sharing of experiences and building on the knowledge that you have into developing a project. Because I think we are not as good at that yet in sharing all that knowledge. So please, so thank you for making me aware of it and we will pick that up. And, and if I don't, please follow up with me because my brain might not always do it and you don't know where how to find me. And the next question I'd like to go and ask from the online, um, from the online, um, um, community is to what extent can peatland restoration costs be offset by payment for ecosystem services or carbon credit from restoration? So, to what extent? Oops, and I just saw um, saw the, the question there, and it's all jumping ahead. So that's the, the, the beauty of being live here. To what extent can peatland restoration costs be offset by payment for ecosystem services or? carbon credits from restoration. Who from my esteemed panel would like to pick up that question? C'est à propos des, des crédits carbone pour le paiement de, de services écosystémiques. C'est bon? Ah, oui, ça va. Yes, please. Bon, en fait, euh, ce qu'il faudra comprendre quand nous, RDC, nous parlons de la valorisation de, du carbone des tourbières, c'est le fait qu'il est important qu'on qu ne se limite pas à la conservation, parce que la conservation ne pose pas de problème. Ce qui pose le problème, c'est comment améliorer le vécu de ceux qui conservent. Je pense qu'à ce niveau-là, il y a une justice qui devra être développée d'abord à l'international. Nous, notre vision, c'est protéger les tourbières pour deux choses. Le peuple, il ne s'agit pas uniquement des peuples de la RDC, il s'agit des peuples du monde, donc vous et moi, mais aussi pour la nature. Donc, il est important qu'on puisse penser à valoriser ce genre d'effort. Maintenant, pour y arriver, il faut qu'il y ait des outils. Comment on va les faire Il va falloir d'abord commencer par identifier un certain nombre d'outils, évaluer ce, ce, ce carbone là où il se trouve, identifier les, les mesures de, de, de valorisation des écosystèmes appropriées par rapport, j'allais dire, au pays, mais aussi par rapport aux communautés. Une communauté X ne va pas nécessairement avoir les mêmes besoins qu'une communauté Y. Donc, tout cela doit être encadré. C'est tout ce travail que nous voulons faire, nous, République démocratique du Congo, à travers notre phase de préparation du pays à la valorisation. Donc, à ce stade, nous n'avons pas encore vu une expérience euh, euh, de valorisation des tourbières qui nous a été reportée et que nous ne pouvons nous inspirer. Et donc, à la fois, comme nous l'avons fait avec le processus RED, nous sommes en train d'inventer la roue dans cette thématique-là. Mais il est important que là où il y a des expériences positives, que vous puissiez communiquer avec nous que vous, pour que nous puissions nous en inspirer. Mais nous pensons qu'on ne doit pas s'arrêter à la conservation. Il faut qu'il y ait aussi l'aspect 
valorisation. C'est là qu'il va falloir trouver des synergies. Pour les autres détails, on peut se rencontrer dans le couloir et échanger. Merci. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that has been great to hear, and it is absolutely critical. And what I picked up from the, from that as well is communities are critical in here as well, and it is, is always what we in our long term history as Wetlands International as well. It's always been clear that we will never get long term sustainable projects if we do not, from the beginning, bring communities on board. That's absolutely critical. Adam. Well, if you wait a minute. Euh, bonjour tout le monde, euh, je me présente, je suis Madame euh, Sylvie Zbo. je suis la conseillère auprès de Madame la vice-première ministre en, en charge de la protection de la forêt et des tourbières. Je vais juste renchérir euh, ce que notre euh, monsieur tourbière du cabinet euh, vient si bien de souligner. Il est important, en fait, il est très important que nous puissions, autour de cette synergie euh, des initiatives de tourbière, mettre un accent particulier sur les populations locales, qui en fait sont vraiment la source euh, par excellence de la protection de ces tourbières, qui jusqu'à aujourd'hui sont pratiquement vierges, si je ne m'abuse. Et je pense qu'il est important de veiller à ce qu'il y ait un maximum d'échanges entre les différents pays pour pouvoir améliorer justement cette manière de faire au niveau de la RDC, apprendre des autres et peut-être même les autres apprendre de nous. Et je pense qu'il faut maximiser euh, les conférences, les réunions, les, les échanges pour pouvoir aboutir à une synergie qui permette qu'aujourd'hui, au sein de toutes les grandes messes, l'action tourbière soit prise vraiment à sa valeur euh, qu'elle mérite. Voilà, c'est juste le petit commentaire que j'avais à faire. Merci, merci à tout le monde. Thank you very much and merci bien. Um, my French is not the, the, what it used to be when I grew up in the Netherlands, but the online translation has really helped. Um, for us, as I said before, it's critical to make sure that people and communities and livelihoods are absolutely to the heart of all these projects. Because only then, if we can provide long-term sustainable futures for the people living in our peatlands, we get a real-time long-term sustainable solutions. So thank you again for coming to that. And I must say, coming from the world that I grew up in, we can learn an awful lot from the experiences that you have. So I would like to, to reach out, as I said, back again and say, how can we bring that knowledge and that understanding from all the countries back into also in, in, in other areas, and how can we share that? And as I said, the Global Peatlands Initiative uh, is, is a key tool and is a key platform to share that. And I would actually like to reach out again to you and say, how can we bring that learning on board? Because that's our same experience further afield. Um, I'm looking back into the room here, and not that I want to disregard our online audience, which is sizable, but I'm also want to look to see if there's any key questions from any of the attendants here in the room. Um, I've got a question here on the back from Faisal. Faisal. Thank you very much. Uh, Faisal Parish, Global Environment Centre, Malaysia. Uh, my question to Chris from uh, uh, GCF. Uh, you mentioned about the lack of uh, many uh, peatland projects in the GCF programme. Um, I'm working in Southeast Asia together with the ASEAN Secretariat, and we're helping the ASEAN 10 member countries to develop a, a regional frameworks to address the peatland management. And we're actually in the process to develop a regional investment framework to bring together multiple stakeholders to support the work on peatlands. You heard about the Indonesia action, but to scale that up and also support in other, other countries. Um, but can you clarify whether or not through GCF it's possible to support such regional initiatives or everything must be country by country initiative uh, through the GCF? Thank you. It's working, yeah. Okay. Okay, that's a very good question. No, GCF has lots of uh, regional programs as well. Uh, prog programs have to be submitted through an accredited entity, like IUCN or um, who else on there, or FAO or UNEP, for example. They're all accredited entities. But uh, regional projects have strengths and weaknesses. The strength is that it can be good for global issues like peatlands. It can uh, reduce transaction costs. It can mobilize a lot of resources across a lot of uh, countries. 
Um, the disadvantages are that maybe a national one can also be maybe quicker sometimes or it's more focused. But definitely we encourage regional projects. Yeah, so that'd be a very interesting one when it comes through. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal, for your question. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure that we will pick up over the next week and a week and a half more about the Asian countries and what we can do there. But it's great to hear from you. I've got a question here from online, and that's quite an interesting one for my esteemed panel. Um, what would be more powerful or likely to protect and restore patents? One, increased access to climate finance to support sustainable use, or two, protection of peatlands or strengthened legislation and monitoring. So is it either finance or legislation? My dear, my dear panel, what's your views? I've got my views, but I'll let you answer that first. Sit on the fence and say it needs both. <laughs> <laughs> it, it definitely, definitely policies without technical assistance and finance often are not very useful. And also finance without policies is, is also not practical. So I think it needs a bit of both, yeah. Um, absolutely. Good to... <laughs> I'm tempted to agree with you, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mat Matial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to, to respond to that, uh, I guess I will use the same word. But perhaps if you can put back the there was a slide on exactly that. Uh, it's probably quite difficult to do that. Maybe okay, you wanted to but, explain it. Okay, but basically, we, we did uh, an inquiry to different countries uh, asking what is the, the, the bottleneck for scaling up action on Pitland. And basically, finance was on the top and also legislation. So that's why also I'm answering both because uh, both of the was really uh, put forward by all the respondents. It was uh, nearly 300 respondents. So it's not just me, it's 300 people sitting in the different countries that are saying legislation and finance together. So, wow. that's okay. a Thank you. And it's good to hear that, uh, Martial. Um, it's also our experience at Wetlands International, and I think from the Global Peatlands Initiative as well, that it's not only we kind of we kind of well know by now the, the first axis on peatlands and management and restoration. That's the ecology, that's the hydrology, and that's what we need to do. We know what to do. That's not the most difficult one. The other two axes, so what do we need to do in terms of governance, legislation, and how do we finance it, are the ones that are always more difficult. The good thing, and as will come through as well, and during this week, but also which being pledged, hopefully during this COP, is that the finance is increasingly being unlocked, not only to initiate projects, but also to, to fund projects. And it might be government fund finance that is actually putting the projects ready for investors to then go and buy into it. So that the, so what is so there is a real interesting um, concept now whereby pipelines of projects are being developed, ready for investors to come on board. And it's good, good to see that. On Thursday, Wetlands International, um, as part of this um, global peat, um, peatland pavilion, is having a day on, <clears throat> in, as part of the day on finance, is also hosting a session exactly on, on private finance. And how can we leverage a multi, and how can we leverage not only um, public finance or private finance, but how can we do that in a way that is maximizing the benefits? And that's really interesting to see that. Um, I was, I've got another question here from the floor. It will be about uh, the Red Plus and Pitland. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, most, many countries, they are a little bit, uh, they don't know how to, the border between the two event uh, phenomena, I can say it. Mm -hmm. so, that's why uh, some countries, uh, like in DRC, mm -hmm. the full-size project we are expecting to develop we will be combining the Red Plus and the Petland. So we can learn more uh, which one is in particular just bringing synergy to the other part. So it will be a good, a good thing to start by uh, such, uh, you know, uh, I can say, I call it like a test. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can do a project text. So it will be helping now the DRC to start by uh, in developing uh, the pit land project, 10 million, 20 million. And from there, we need to learn to bring to the high scale level. Thank you. Thank you. And 
as always, you are nearly taking the words right out of my mouth because you're absolutely correct. Um, the experience, the global experience is more and more that peatlands and wetlands needs to be protected on a landscape scale. And that landscape scale is where water is, water is a driving force through the landscape. And then the different habitats, wetlands, peatlands, are a mosaic, mosaic within there. So the only when we get it to that higher level, where there is a combination of Red Plus and, and for example, peatlands, where we can combine these initiatives, we really start being able to, to maximize and to scale up and truly manage the whole, the whole, the whole system on a landscape scale. I think m that the notion of managing on a landscape scale, whereby it is a combination of water, of carbon, and of people in the landscape, is really crucial. And I think we're now starting to drift, drift as well outside the whole confines of this particular session now. So what I'm planning to do and what I'm going to do is I'm going to thank all the speakers that were here on the panel today, um, thank all the audience that was sitting online and that served us so amazing good questions from online. Thanks the audience here within the Peatlands Pavilion and within Glasgow. As I said in the previous session this morning when I opened up, I live about 45 minutes drive up the road. Um, the, the, uh, Scotland is full of peatlands. It is an honor to have all of you here today and have you all of here this week and next week as well. And let's really work together to make sure that peatlands are an integrated component of NDCs. And let's learn from each other to see what kind of projects we can, we can so we, that we can expand and, and scale up. Because we've got a multitude of pilot projects across the world whereby peatlands are being restored, but we need to go into that next level of scaling up. Landscape scale, integrating different finance sources, but also thinking outside that box and thinking about how private finance, for example, can come on board is all very key to that. So with that, thank you audience here, thank you audience online, and I'm going to close this session. Thank you. <laughs>